Good. Don't pose the problem as well. So, thank you very much. So, my name is Lynn Camerlin, and I'm an associate professor in computational structural biology from Uppsala University. I'm also a former postdoctoral researcher of Ariane Warshall's. And uh, I consider both Ari and Michael to be great friends, mentors, and people whom I really admire both scientifically and personally. So as you can imagine, it was wonderful news this year to find out they'd been awarded the 2013 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And so it's a great pleasure to be here today to talk a little bit about Warshall's legacy, both his effect in my own career, and also how I think, you can't hear me? It was, uh, I think it's just too far from me. Can you hear me okay? Okay, it's perfect. So uh, anyhow, so as both Ari and Michael are people whom I admire deeply, it's a great pleasure to be here today to get to talk to you a little bit about Ari's impact on my career and the field in general, and also what I think his legacy is going to be in the years to come. So I'm really grateful also to the organizers for having invited me to be here. So if we start a little bit with my own background, I introduced myself as a structural biologist. My actual original training is not at all in structural biology, I'm a theoretical organic chemist. And what I'm really interested in is trying to understand the mechanisms of phosphorus oxygen bond cleavage in different environments. Now this might seem to be a very, very specialized and esoteric thing to study, but phosphate hydrolysis is actually the one of the most important reactions to biology. It's ubiquitous and it shows up in everything from cellular signaling to energy production, DNA synthesis, maintaining the integrity of our genetic material. So from a purely biological standpoint, it's a really important reaction to study. But also from a chemical standpoint, it's a very interesting reaction. First of all, because phosphate cleavage is an incredibly slow reaction. So if we take as one example, let me hope my mouse is actually working. So if we take as one example, the phosphorus oxygen linkages that hold together our DNA, for these to break under neutral conditions at 25 degrees centigrade without a cat uh, catalyst, the half-life for that reaction is something in the range of 31 million years. And yet once enzymes get involved, this is a process that happens on the order of microseconds. So of course, it's also very interesting to try to figure out how on earth this happens, and this makes the enzymes that catalyze these reactions among the most proficient enzymes known on the planet. So of course, trying to understand the enzyme catalysis in general has never been a trivial problem, but trying to understand phosphate hydrolysis in particular is complicated by the fact that the chemistry of this reaction is really non-trivial. So a quirk of uh, the phosphorus atom in general is that it actually allows for multiple mechanistic pathways. So even the simplest phosphate esters in aqueous solution, you have nothing fancy going on. This, okay, now I have phosphate diesters, but even the monoester, you don't have to worry yet about substituent effects, acid-base catalysis, etc. You have multiple different chemically similar pathways that are possible. And the problem is that experimental data can't unambiguously distinguish between these. And computationally, you get very exhausted because if you really want to understand what's going on, you need to in some form try to probe every possible pathway. And so it becomes a really, really major headache. And so this is before you even toss in a biological system. So this is what I did for a long time before I went to Warshall's group during my PhD and during a short first postdoc in Vienna. And one of the big challenges, so even working with model compounds, at the point I was a PhD student, computers had gotten fast enough that you could do more reasonable quantum chemical calculations, but you were still stuck with small model systems in the gas phase if you wanted to take something as big as phosphorus and to really try to look at either energy landscapes or every possible feasible transition state. Later, I moved on to MD, and we were trying to look at local conformational changes. So this is a protein tyrosine phosphatase, PTP1B. It's really, really important as a potential therapeutic target for treating type 2 diabetes and obesity. And one of the challenges with trying to inhibit this enzyme is that all protein tyrosine phosphatases share a common active site sequence. So basically, if you go for the classical approach of trying to target active site inhibitors, you might get something that's tight binding, but it'll knock out all other PTPs. A trick you can do with this enzyme is that you have this conformational change. It's really crucial for catalysis because it positions a general base in the right position to do chemistry. If you can block that, you can actually selectively inhibit the enzyme. But of course, at this stage, it's still quite far from trying to understand the enzyme function. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is because Warshall got his Nobel Prize for doing multiscale modeling, but this was actually not the reason I went to work with him. The main reason I went to work with him 
was because if you want to look at phosphate chemistry, Warshall was, was and is one of the leading theoreticians when it comes to doing this. So one of the things I'd like to just touch on at different points in my talk is that there's a danger when you get a major distinction for something that people forget the other contributions you made along the way. So I'd like to highlight some of the things I think that are almost as important, if not more so in some cases, than the work that got the Nobel Prize. So basically, over the past few decades, Warshall has actually done a lot of work on trying to understand phosphate hydrolysis, both model systems and in different biological systems. I don't want to show all of them to you, but just for example, one example, this is work from the 90s, and he was doing EVB calculations trying to understand the chemical step catalyzed by RAS GTPase. It's a signaling pro uh, protein that's an important treatment for cancer therapy. And uh, basically, he was looking at just RAS itself, RAS in complex with GAP, which allosterically activates RAS. And so this is now a simulation from the 90s, if I can get this to work. So what you're seeing here is a GTP hydrolysis reaction, water molecule attacking this phosphate, breaking this bond. Something that might seem trivial, there's this question of what happens to the proton on this water molecule. You just saw it fly to the phosphate. It might not seem like a big deal, but this was actually really controversial from a chemical point of view. No one actually considered the possibility you could have a substrate-assisted mechanism. Computationally, it agrees with all the experimental data. You can reproduce the effect of mutations. When you try to change a paradigm, you have a major uphill battle. But the thing is that now, about 20 years later, this is a completely non-controversial mechanism for trying to understand GTP hydrolysis. And so obviously, since I was really into phosphate chemistry and Warshall was really into phosphate chemistry, it seemed like the most logical place to go to do a postdoc. So this is a little bit of background about uh, why I went there, a little bit of background about why Warshall was awarded the Nobel Prize. Of course, if you want to do consistent studies of phosphate hydrolysis, you need to have the correct computational tools to go about doing this. And Warshall has actually made a lot of really important contributions uh, to shape what we consider to be computational biology today. So, for example, one of his earliest contributions dates back to when he was still a PhD student with Schneer Lifson. And basically, a really major advance for the field was realizing that if you want to look at fundamental physical properties and structural dynamics of a system, you can actually use uh, well-parameterized empirical functions and it's actually enough to describe the system as balls and springs. It's something you take for granted today, but molecular mechanics was actually a really major advance in the field. So Warshall, during his PhD, he developed the first consistent force field. There are a number of really important advances at this point, and one of them was the understanding. So at the time, people were super stressed because they were trying to optimize in internal coordinates. And if you try to do optimization in internal coordinates, you get really complex interdependent transformational matrices. So even optimizing a small molecule can turn to be a complete nightmare. So one of the really, really big advances at this point was understanding that you don't actually have to use internal coordinates. You can use Cartesian coordinates and suddenly, if you're working in Cartesian coordinates, you remove a lot of the problems people were having with internal coordinates. And uh, optimization and producing physical properties like vibrational spectra, if not trivial, it becomes substantially easier. And so this CFF force field, there have been people who developed on it over the decades, particularly a lot of work in Denmark. Even if most of you don't use CFF, of course, it's the basis for any modern force fields today. So this, I would say, is quite a major contribution to the field. But of course, the thing is, that it's about this time, throughout the 60s and at some point in the 70s, Warshall also became interested in the question of how do enzymes actually work. It's one that's baffled enzymologists for well over a century. And the problem is, of course, it's really important to be able to understand structural and dynamic properties. But the thing is, this doesn't explain how function is actually happening. And so there's a challenge at this point. You can basically look at dynamical properties of the system using molecular mechanics, using a force field based approach, but you can't make and break bonds. So you can't actually study chemistry. Around the same time, there are advances being made in programming packages to do quantum mechanical calculations. But of course, even today in 2014, you can't do a high level QM treatment of an entire enzyme, for example. So of course, this becomes a bottleneck in trying to move forward. And this leads to the work that actually got him the Nobel Prize which is basically the understanding that you don't actually have to treat the entire system at the same level of theory. 
Of course, you need to use some sort of quantum mechanical description to describe the reacting region, otherwise you can't make chemistry happen. But something that's occurring 15, 20 angstrom, angstrom away from uh, the reacting atoms, those you can actually treat using a classical description of balls and springs. So this was basically the birth of multi-scale modeling. And of course, all three laureates made major contributions in this direction. So I'm going to just give you a little bit of a chronological background of how he actually reached this point and show you the early work that laid the foundation to what you can actually computationally do today. Now, I apologize if this is a little bit too much chemistry. I do need to highlight this because in the context of work that Warshall's done later, so I don't know how many people in the audience are actually doing quantum chemistry. If any of you are doing quantum chemistry, I'm guessing that just statistically likely, most likely scenario is that you're using some sort of molecular orbital based QM program. And the MO theory has long been a dominant theory in quantum mechanics uh, for among other reasons, the fact that it's actually much easier to program than the alternative. But there has long been an alternative, which is to use a valence bond description it's ultimately two languages to describe the same thing. You have some clear differences. For example, you're working with localized orbitals instead of delocalized orbitals, which you have in MO theory. Now, in the 1950s, 60s, with the advent of digital computers, there was this big problem that it's a complete nightmare to program. So things that you can do very trivially with MO theory become uh, almost impossible to do with VB theory. The reason I bring this up is because a lot of Warshall's earlier work was with VB theory. And the past few decades since the 80s have actually seen a steady resurgence of interest in VB-based approaches. Just one example, there was a SECAM workshop in Paris in 2012 on ab initio valence bond theory. And this workshop drew about 80 people, including world-leading computational chemists and computational biologists. So even if VB lost that to MO theory for a very long time, it's likely to become more and more important in the years and decades to come. Now this is just to give a framework for understanding some of Warshall's early work. So basically, very early on, so Warshall came to this realization together with his colleagues that of course you don't need to treat everything at the same level of theory. Early on, he was still working within a framework where you do decoupled QM plus MM calculations. You treat part of the system quantum mechanically, you treat the environment classically, but these are still essentially two separate entities. He made some major progress, even uh, at this stage with small systems. So for example, so one of some of his earliest calculations were valence bond based QM plus VB plus MM calculations. He was looking at uh, isotope effects in this 4A, 4B dihydrofenanthrenes. And later when he joined Martin Karplus's lab as a postdoc, so at the time Martin Karplus was very interested in studying retinol, he picked up on some of this work and he managed to implement code where you could do molecular orbital based QM plus MM calculations to look at the ground and excited state potential surfaces of large conjugated molecules like retinol. And this work was particularly important because it led to what I personally believe to be his most groundbreaking paper. It's a 1976 paper on the, basically he suggested a bicycle pedal model for the first step in the vision process. So I'm going to show you a movie that he kindly shared with me. This is from of course very old simulations. The movie is based on the actual trajectory that was in this 1976 paper. And what he did at this point, he was basically looking at the light induced photoisomerization of retinol. It's a cis trans isomerization. And the key thing is because it's a light induced process, it's an ultra fast process. It occurs on a time scale of about six picoseconds, which is the absolute limit of what you could computationally model at that point in time. You see, it's a really, really simplified model. And one of the really controversial suggestions he made at the time, so he suggested that this is a stepwise model. He actually made models by hand suggesting this bicycle pedal motion. What makes this paper really spectacular is the fact that he really put his neck out there. He made a grand suggestion that challenged what everyone thought in the field. And he did this with essentially no experimental data. There was no structural data. He really had to go based just on the fundamental physics of the system. And what's really amazing is he actually got it correct. About 12 years later, there was experimental data that showed that in fact this bicycle pedal model is not so crazy after all. And just to give you an idea of how far you can get with the right physics, so this is a very simplified paper from 1976. It took 30 years before computers were powerful enough that you could do high level ab initio calculations on this system just to show that he essentially had it right all along. 
So if you only ever read one per paper that Warshaw wrote, I suggest it's this 1976 paper. So basically, this is a little bit of the early work. We're still working in a QM plus MM framework. And this is a really important distinction because um, like me, Warshall was also very interested in trying to understand how enzymes work. And uh, there are some problems if you try to describe an enzyme using a QM plus MM framework. So the late 1960s were a really, really important point in time for structural biology. Late 1960s, you could finally start solving protein structures, and the really groundbreaking moment for structural biology was when people could solve the structure of a hen egg white lysozyme. This was the first enzyme to have its crystal structure solved, and it was basically, one could argue, the moment in the field where people realized you can actually use structural data to infer functional information. So this was really, in a sense, the birth of mechanistic enzymology. And one of the things that's interesting with hen egg white lysozyme is that from structural data, it appears to distort its substrate. So this led to an idea that lasted for essentially several decades in a sense, that strain is a really, really important feature in understanding enzyme catalysis. Now, already in the 70s, Michael Levitt challenged this. He did simulations that showed that enzymes are actually flexible, so this argues against the strain hypothesis. And in terms of method methodological advances, he did a landmark energy minimization of lysozyme. So one of the things Warshall was interested in at this point in time was that he wanted to see what would happen if he'd couple his QM plus MM program. So he had this QCFF all program, which was a molecular orbital-based QM plus MM program, what would happen if you were to couple this with uh, Michael's energy minimization program and try to actually look at the chemical step catalyzed by lysozyme? And he did this and got a spectacularly high activation barrier. It was essentially completely unphysical and the reaction would never happen. And this is where the coupling is absolutely crucial because the reason he got such a spectacularly high activation barrier is the fact that the reaction catalyzed by lysozyme is actually a charge separation process. So if you don't have correct coupling to the external environment, you're never going to get physically meaningful results. So this was a back to the drawing board moment because it's actually not that trivial to figure out the correct coupling. People who work in QMMM are still fighting over this today and there's a lot of ideas about how this should be done. But you have another big problem. You need to take into account the effect of the environmental charges. So you need some sort of proper description of your environment, uh, some sort of microscopic description. But it's the 1970s and your computer is not going to cooperate with that because I just showed you you can run six picoseconds of dynamics. So one of the solutions, in addition to understanding the quantum mechanics of the system, is that Warshall developed a model where you could actually describe the solvent using basically Langevin dipoles. These are dipoles on a preset grid. And so this was one of the first microscopic solvent models uh, in contrast to the continuum models that were popularly used at the time. And after a lot of pain and suffering, he came up with a way to actually take into account the effect of the external charges. And once you couple properly to the environment, suddenly you get physically meaningful results. Now, he made one further breakthrough and, uh, okay, he made many more, but in this QMMM direction, which was a further simplification of QMMM, where basically in the 1980s, inspired in part by Marcus' theory for electron transfer, he proposed this empirical valence bond model. And conceptually, this is a very simple QMMM model. It's hard to get the math correct on paper, but it's one of those things where you have a eureka moment afterwards. So anyone who's familiar with Marcus' theory should be familiar with these parabolae. The general idea is to basically do QMMM using empirical force field-like functions, so it's empirical or semi-empirical QMMM. You have different reacting states for your system. You describe these different reacting states as being minima of these different zero-order diabetic parabolae. You basically use force field-like functions to describe the bonding patterns of the different reacting states. And from this, you construct an n by n Hamiltonian, which you can then diagonalize using empirical parameters describing the coupling between these states and the position of the parabola to get the actual adiabatic ground state free energy surface. Now, there are a number of advantages to doing this. One is that a very well parameterized force field carries a tremendous amount of chemical information. So you can actually describe bond making and bond breaking processes in a physically meaningful way. The other advantage of this is that it's incredibly fast. So QMMM free energy calculations were actually out of reach for many people for a long period of time. 
People have started doing more of this now, but you still need to do tremendously long sampling if you want to get meaningful converge-free energies. And the advantage of the EVB approach is, of course, that at any given point in time, you can do order of magnitudes longer simulations. So the most recent EVB paper we just submitted is actually doing QMMM calculations on the microsecond timescale, which is something you can't actually do using higher level QM approaches at the moment. So these are methodological advances. Of course, once you have the methodology, the key thing is the method. So one of the things that Warshall always taught me as a postdoc is that the method is nice to have, but the method is, of course, a way to solve a problem. It's not a means to an end. And so, of course, the purpose here was not to develop a lot of fancy algorithms, but to have a way where you could actually understand how enzymes work. And so I've touched on a couple of really major contributions. The third really major contribution, and this, uh, along with the bicycle pedal model, is basically Warshall's biggest contribution to the field, is an early understanding of the role of electrostatics in enzyme catalysis. So the question how enzymes work is probably one of the most heated questions in biochemistry. People have argued back and forth about it. I don't think even today in 2014 that people really fully know the answer to this question. But one of the things Warshall showed in 1978 was actually pretty much almost all, if not the vast majority of the catalytic power of enzymes can be attributed simply to a reduction in reorganization energy compared to the uncatalyzed background reaction. So just putting this in qualitative terms, so of course an enzyme is a catalyst, so you're doing a rate acceleration compared to the, another reaction. And uh, in the background reaction, as you basically go from the ground state to a polarized transition state, you start from randomly oriented water molecules that reorient their dipoles to optimally stabilize this transition state. And the energetic penalty of this reorganization is actually quite high. So what Warshall argued was that in a protein active site, what uh, pro an, an enzyme does is to sacrifice some of its folding free energy. Obviously enzymes are dynamic entities, so you can't start out perfectly pre-organized, but you create this locally strained environment that what you gain out of doing this is that you orient these dipoles in the best possible position to optimally stabilize this transition state. Now with a rigorous computational model, you can quantify these different contributions and you'll see that the difference in reorganization between the background reaction and the enzyme catalyzed reaction is actually very large. He's studied a wide range of systems over the years, so from usual culprits like ketosteroidized isomerase and carbonic anhydrase to much more exotic systems. He, the thing with the EVB approach is that it's very good at rigorously producing experimental observables like temperature dependence of isotope effects, effective mutations, etc. And one of the key things is that this electrostatic pre-organization concept can actually account for the catalytic effect of most, if not all, enzymes. So I don't have so much time left, but of course the title of my talk is Ira Warshall's Legacy. So for the last couple of minutes, these are the major contributions he made to the field. I just want to talk about work we're doing and work I think will be important in the decades to come. And of course, we've been many people who've worked for him and he's affected many people who haven't directly worked for him. So it's impossible in 25 minutes to talk about all the contributions he's made to our careers and everything he's taught us. What I just wanted to show you is some of the problems that I'm interested in that I think would have been impossible without the methodology that he developed. So we're making much more progress towards understanding the question of how do enzymes work, but the logical next question after that is how do enzymes evolve? And if you want to study evolution, which is useful both for basically understanding generally how function diverges within enzyme superfamilies, but also for artificial enzyme design, the thing is you need an approach that's extremely fast. You need to look at multiple substrates, mutations, do long timescale simulations, and the EVB is absolutely perfect for doing this because you can really do quick long timescale simulations. You don't want to spend three months doing good DFT MM free energy calculation just to discover you made some mistake in your setup and realize you have 20 more substrates to go. Once again, it seems electrostatics is absolutely crucial. Of course, if you have a, an approach that can predict mutations, you have a really great tool for artificial enzyme design. We've been also looking at protein conformational landscapes, coupling the EVB to this renormalization approach that allows you to directly look at the coupling between the conformational and chemical steps, both for looking at enzyme dynamics, other people have used this for looking at ion channels, 
and even very large systems such as the rotary motion of F1 ATPs. And this is absolutely crucial because if you want to understand this system, it's a massive system, you can't do this all at home, and you have to take into account the effect of the ATP if you want to really get a physically meaningful answer out of this. And so then the last thing, since I'm running out of time, so I showed you how I started out as a PhD student do, desperately trying to do gas-phase QM models of small reactions. Through a collaboration with Johan Oakfist, some of the most recent work we've been doing is looking at GTP hydrolysis on the ribosome. So computers in the field have come a really long way just in 10 years, and there's a lot of exciting stuff to come. I have here a brief timeline of contributions from basically this early 1968 work through to the present day. One of the key disadvantages with the Nobel Prize is that you give this to three people. So you, of course, uh, by force, you end up uh, not mentioning the contributions of so many people who've made important contributions along the way. The two main things I want to show you from this timeline, the first of these is that as of 2013, all three laureates were still scientifically active. And also, this QMMM approach that was developed back in the 70s has become so ubiquitous that just this year alone, there are over 7,600 articles in the first half year of 2014 that use it. So to wrap up, I have, of course, many people to thank, people who work with me, collaborate with me, provide funding. But more importantly, this is a collage of all the people who've worked with ARIA over the years. It takes forever to put something like this together. This was done by Patrick Schopf, a current postdoc with Russell. And of course, even though the rest of his group are not here, I'm sure they all agree with me that we're very grateful for what he's taught us and we're very happy for him for this distinction. So thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.